How many of you know that the word of God is a strong tower? The righteous run to it and they are saved. Uh, yes, it is. God's word is a, a safety net for each and every one of us. The word is a powerful source of strength and power to it. And so I'm always delighted when I have an opportunity to open up the word of the living God and our lives are transformed and changed. I've been blessed each and every night as we've gone over the word. We've talked about the blood uh, that that is new and the blood never loses its power. Somebody ought to say amen. Uh, and the power is, is that we've got to constantly come up under the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, it reminds us that if we have the blood that the, the devil cannot go, uh, he can only go as far as the Lord allows him to when the blood is covering you. Amen. Uh, and it lets us also know that when you're covered in the blood, uh, that the blood becomes a source of strength and power for you. We talked about being in transition, realizing that God wants to transition us from where we are to where he wants us to be. I read a powerful book uh, 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 in, uh, a few years ago. It said, what got you here can't get you there. Somebody ought to say, yes, Lord. Uh, uh, what got me where I am today won't get me where I need to be tomorrow. And, and so you need God to constantly transition you from where you are today to where he wants you to be on tomorrow. And, and so we talked about these powerful words and, uh, and, and allowed the Lord to speak into our lives. And on last night, I begin the process of talking about healing for our what? our damaged emotions. Uh, uh, we recognize that every single one of us has some level of damage in our lives. Uh, amen. In fact, those of you who are not damaged, raise your hand. You're not damaged. You're not damaged, right? You don't get any hands raised because they're, I say, hey, you're trying to raise your phone. No, you're damaged too. <laughs> uh, every single one of us is damaged to some degree. We are damaged, and, uh, and, and on today I want to continue in the word that I started on last night, healing for our damaged emotions. Uh, and, and grab your Bibles with me tonight. Turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 22. I want to read verses actually 33 through verse 40 on this morning. Matthew, chapter 22, and verse 33 through verse 40 in God's word on this morning. Matthew 22. Verse 33 through verse 40 in God's word on today. I hear some pages still turning and uh, I'll give you a chance to get to Matthew chapter 22 verses 33 through verse 40. Good to see some of my friends from Lewisham here on today. Uh, yes, I've, I've been to Lewisham Church several times since I've been here in London. I've been to Willesden. I've been uh, uh, to churches in North England. And so I've, I've good to see some of my Lewisham friends here uh, I, as well on this morning. And the word of God says this in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 33. It says, when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard, that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Verse 35, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Verse 39, and he second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as who everybody? As thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Uh, I want to preach to you from the message entitled, Healing for Our Damaged Emotions, uh, with the subtitle, The Low Self-Esteem Trap. The Low Self-Esteem Trap, Satan's Deadliest Weapon. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today that 
that the sun is shining. We thank you today, Lord, that you have allowed us to come into your house. Now, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us today, that, Father, that the written word would become the spoken word, that the spoken word would become the living word, and that the living word today would change our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let somebody say amen. On last night, we embarked upon a journey towards the healing of our damaged emotions. And we recognized on last night that one of the biggest challenges to uh, freedom and the biggest challenges to grace and one of the biggest challenges to us growing up into Christ is our inability to receive and to give the grace of God to each other. It causes some of the most and some of the most challenging emotional hangups in our lives. Uh, because we learn like any other part of our body that gets damaged and emotions, uh, gets damaged and broken, uh, the same is true with our emotional lives. It can become damaged and broken like anything else in our lives. When our minds and our emotions get damaged by life trauma, there is also a healing that God wants to take place in us to bring us peace and tranquility. However, the difficulty with all of this is when, is, is when you injure your eye because your eye is critical to the daily functions of your life, you have a tendency to seek healing and medical attention immediately when you hurt or damage your eye. Isn't that true? Uh, and the reason why is, uh, as I've just mentioned, why you do this. Number one, uh, you cannot function if your eye is damaged. Number two, uh, you, you, uh, you go and seek quick attention if you damage your eye. Number two, uh, is probably it's going to hurt very badly. If you damage your eye, uh, uh, I don't know about you. If you uh, there are two things that, that will debilitate you quickly. N number one is if you get a toothache. Have you ever gotten a real toothache? If you get a real toothache, it'll bring you to your knees like nothing else will. And number two, the other thing that will bring you to your knees is that if you damage your eye, you, you, will, you will curl up in a ball. You will cry until you get the thing solved. So number one. You can't function. Number two, it hurts very badly. And number three, you are trying to avoid further damage and permanent damage. Therefore, you seek attention quickly. But the problem with damaged emotions is that, number one, they normally do not hurt physically. Number two, you can function to some degree, at least on the surface, with damaged emotions uh, because people don't quickly and readily recognize that your emotions are in disarray. And number three, you fail to see how not treating it will harm you in the future. The reason we put off seeking help or choosing to be healed is that we believe a few lies that keep us from moving forward. Lie number one when it comes to healing of our damaged emotion. Lie number one, we believe that time heals all wounds. Haven't you heard it, that, that time will heal all wounds? But the reality is, is that time does not heal all of your wounds. Why does time not heal all of your wounds? Because the truth is, is that some wounds take specialized healing that time alone cannot correct. Number two, here's number two. Real Christians should not experience emotional damage. That is a lie. Real Christians do experience emotional damage. And just because you get baptized, just because you take communion, just because you have your name written on the books at the church does not mean you will not encounter damage to your emotions. Here's line number three. I can figure it out by myself. 
You know, when we are Christians, and, and sometimes, I found this about seven, eight minutes Christians, sometimes we are the most stubborn Christians you ever come across. Adventist Christians feel like I can figure it out all by myself. But the truth be told this morning is that every single one of us needs help at some point in our experience. That's why I love the man who, 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 who was carried on his mat by his four friends. He recognized that I needed help. Sometimes God puts you on your back to get you to a place to recognize that you cannot fix you. We all need somebody at some point in our lives. That's why we are a community of believers. That's why we call ourselves brothers and sisters. But the challenge is we don't always act like brothers and sisters. We don't always carry each other's mats. We don't always help each other when we truly need it. And number four myth and lie that we tell ourselves my problem is not really that bad i'm making too big a deal of that little incident and that little challenge and so what we do is that we avoid it or we suppress the information altogether and, and i've come to realize that i know i've been talking about healing for your damaged emotions and i'm not ignorant this morning that some of you are sitting here and say preacher i had a pretty normal life uh, my parents were okay i was spared the trauma of what you speak of uh, i am the first to graduate from university in my family i'm a supervisor on my job my my children are well adjusted. I can manage the ups and downs of life. I'm sorry, Pastor. This is a good series and a good sermon for somebody. And I recognize that it is needed. It's just not for me. But I want to applaud you, preacher, for dealing with this subject. But as for me and my emotions, uh, I am not damaged. In fact, I consider my emotions to be quite intact and quite healthy. My only question to you this morning is this. If your emotions are so intact, why is it that your wife cannot speak about your mother? If your emotions are so intact, why is it always somebody else's fault? If your emotions are so intact, uh, then why can't you keep your anger in check? If your emotions are so intact, why is that that an intimacy only happens in the dark? If your emotions are so intact, then why do you get so defensive when your spouse brings up money? Have mercy. I, I, you just wait a minute. I'm coming down your aisle. Uh, if your emotions are so intact, why do you, you cannot commit to being in a relationship with only one person? Uh, if your emotions are so intact, why can't you keep a job for more than six months? Uh, if your emotions are so intact, why is it that you don't have any real friends? If your emotions are so intact, uh, why do you shut down where there's an argument with your husband or with your wife? Oh, yes, Lord. If your emotions are so intact, why do you need a smoke just to calm your nerves? Uh, if your emotions are so intact, why do you need a drink just to settle down after work? Uh, if your emotions are so intact, why do you spend half your paycheck on clothes uh, just so you feel good about yourself? If your emotions are so intact, why do you buy a car that you really can't afford? Uh, if your emotions are so intact, why are you popping sleeping pills uh, just to go to sleep at night uh, if your emotions are so intact why do you think you're ugly when you look in the mirror you see some of us sat back on last night and and said to yourself this series is for hurt and broken people but i'm okay uh, but the truth be told this morning we are all damaged goods I don't care if you were born in a hospital or by a nanny in the back room. If you came out of your mother's womb, then by default, you have damaged emotions. We have all been born in sin and shapened in iniquity. I might look like I got it together, but I'm damaged. 
My tie might be nice, but I'm damaged. Uh, you might have come from the hairdresser on yesterday, but you're damaged. Uh, you might drive a S500, but you're still damaged. Uh, you might live in a glass palace, but you're damaged. Uh, you might be cute, honey child, but you're still damaged. Uh, turn to somebody and say, hi, I'm damaged. Yes, Lord. Uh, don't you feel better already? Hi, I'm damaged. Look at somebody. Look at, look at somebody else and say to them, no, hi, I'm really damaged. Look at somebody. Say, hi, I'm really damaged. I'm damaged. Uh, look at somebody else and say, I'm messed up. <laughs> look at somebody else and say, I got some issues. <laughs> You might not see them on the surface, but if you live with me for more than two weeks, uh, you'll notice that I got some problems. Uh, you'll notice that I, I don't always put the toothpaste cover back on the toothpaste. You'll, you'll notice. Oh. I'm damaged. It's good to, 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 to speak the truth. It's good to get it out because you recognize that if you're damaged, then you are a work in progress. You see, God can't do anything for you or with you while you think you're okay. It's those who realize that I am liable to curse somebody out that God can fix. It's those who realize I'm liable to go off the deep end that God can begin to cure. Uh, I, uh, it's those who realize that, 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 that I'm prone to, uh, to, to do uh, all kinds of manner of craziness. That, that when you realize that you got issues, then God can actually correct and fix you. It's the person who thinks that their life is 100% okay that God can't do anything with that person. That was the problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees of Jesus they they felt like they were all together and because they felt like they had it together they didn't need Jesus but like Paul says the good that I would do I do it not and the evil which I would not that I do oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of death away to the thoughts that you're going to find the perfect mate you know some people don't get married and you know why some people don't get married uh, uh, they don't get married because they're waiting for God to send them the perfect person I want to give you a news flash this morning the perfect person does not exist the person that, that God sh nods his head and say, that's the person for you. I've come to tell you that even that person is damaged. And listen, can, can, I, get, can I get somebody to testify? You've been married more than five years and you've come to realize that my, my husband or my wife is damaged good. Just raise your hand. You, re you realize you've been married more. Oh, Lord. We only, oh, have mercy. Yeah. See, see, you know what that tells me? That tells me that your relationship is not that good because you can't even tell the truth. Listen, my wife knows I'm damaged. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. And she still loves me anyway. Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, you ought, you, there's no greater joy than to know that somebody knows you're messed up, but they still love you. Amen. That they know that you don't got it all together, but they still enjoy being around you. That's the beauty. And that's why true Christian marriage is a true uh, uh, indicator of the love of God. Because everyone who sees people who are together and they love each other, even though they're not perfect. Because here's the incredible reality. God loves you and God loves me even though we're not perfect. Praise be to God. Look at your wife and say, or your husband if you're married, and just look at him. Just nothing. say, you're damaged. Y'all can't even see. I'm a, I'm Pastor Bovell, they in trouble. Look at him and say, you're damaged. Yeah. <laughs> you look and say, you damaged. <laughs> not me. <laughs> Are you mess up? <laughs> Are you trash? <laughs> you damage. <laughs> we have to take you to the mechanic can fix you up. <laughs> you bust up. <laughs> Me good. <laughs> That's why we have so much trouble. You. The reality is that every single one of us is damaged goods.
the faster we come to the reality that we are all a part of the broken human race, is that the faster we settle in our minds that we need each other and we can afford to be patient with one another. We can afford to be kind to one another. We can afford to be loving with one another. We can afford to be understanding with each other. The text that we looked at on this morning, I believe, shed light on why there's such an epidemic of damaged emotions. It's a text right out of the book of Matthew, chapter 22, that we read earlier. And it says, and when the multitude heard this, that they were astonished at his doctrine. Uh, you know, every time they hear Jesus, they, they're astonished at what Jesus says. Because when Jesus comes, he doesn't say what they've been taught their whole lives. What they, what, what, what they were expecting to Jesus to come and teach them was more legalistic approach to God. But Jesus comes and he busts the church wide open because he comes to show them that God is more than just a legalist. In fact, God is not a legalist at all. God is a relational God. And he comes and, and, and the multitude heard they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered together. You see, the Sadducees and the Sa Pharisees were arch enemies in the church. They went to church, but they hated each other's guts. One believed in the, uh, uh, that there was no resurrection of the dead, and the other believed that there was a resurrection of the dead. And when Jesus, if you read a few verses before the verse I just read you, uh, uh, Jesus puts the Sadducees to silence and let them know that there is a resurrection of the dead. Because he lets them know that God is the God of the living and not the God of the dead. So the Pharisees hear this and they pounce upon the opportunity to come to Jesus and, and then one of them which was a lawyer asked him a question tempting him saying master which is the greatest commandment in the law? Notice, notice notice what they're, they're after a legal approach to God so much of what we've been taught about about Christianity is a very legal ta teaching about Christianity and they're, and they're trying to trap Jesus because they're trying to say hey Jesus here's what we're trying to do uh, we're trying to make you say something that's going to make you a blasphemer but how many of you know that you can never get Jesus tied up that Jesus has always has a way of escape from every problem that comes his way and Jesus Jesus does something Jesus says unto them thou shalt he gives them the answer in the first few verses that they were looking for. He gives them the legal answer to satisfy the legal, the legalists in the crowd. He says, listen, okay, he said, I'm going to give you the answer. He says, Jesus said unto them, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And, every, and, 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 the, and the lawyer who thought that he was going to give them some different answer, he's, he's astonished. But Jesus doesn't end there. How many know that Jesus will not leave you the way he found you? I don't care where Jesus finds you. He can find you in the gutter, but he won't leave you the same after he gets done with you. He can find you in the bar or in the pub, but he won't leave you the same way he finds you when he's done with you. He might find you out on the street, but I thank God today he won't leave me the way he found me. Thanks be to God. But Jesus does something incredible. He says, this is the first and great commandment. And then verse 19, he switches it up onto him. And the second is like unto it. He says, don't. Yes, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul. He says, but here's what I want you to do. This is just as important as loving God. He says, you've got to love thy neighbor as thyself. He says, I'm going to mess you up, guys, now. Because they thought that if I have done my duty, if, if, I, if, I, if I love the Lord thy God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, that's all I have to do to be accepted by God. God says, no, 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 no. It's just like when Jesus looks at the Ten Commandments and people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees read the Ten Commandments. They look at, hey, if I, if I thou shalt not kill, I'm okay. Thou shalt not commit adultery, I'm okay. I, I, if I don't do these things, I'm okay. And Jesus says, no, no, not so quickly. He says, if you're mad with your brother without a cause, you've committed murder. He says, yeah, 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 thou shalt not lust. He said, but listen, if you look at a woman to lust of her, you've committed adultery already in your 
He says because the commandments go deeper than just legal requirements, the commandments go to your heart. Here's a root of the underlying emotional damage. It's found in verse 19, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as who? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as who? Thy who? Haven't we been taught to kill self and to hate self? Haven't we been taught that as Christians? Think about that for just a moment. What do you hear oftentimes? Uh, uh, you've, got, you've got to crucify what? You've got your, 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 your selfishness is what's terrible. You, you, we've actually been taught as believers to actually not love ourselves. Think about it for just a minute. We've been taught to, my flesh is terrible, and, 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 and you got to watch out for self, and, and you've got to watch out that self will not destroy you. And so there is, a, there is a, a cognitive dissonance when you hear this particular verse from Jesus, love thy neighbor as thy... And you're saying, wait a minute, God, haven't I been taught that self is the enemy? My flesh is my enemy. My thoughts are my enemy. And, and God, what are you saying? Love my neighbor as, and that's what's the problem in Christianity today, because we have no ability to love ourselves. Therefore, we are unable to love others. And therefore, unable to actually love others. God. What does Galatians 4.20 says? It, it says that, that, very thing, that very thing. It says, listen, if you cannot love your brother whom you have, how can you love God whom you have what? An indicator of whether or not you actually love God is how you treat other people. And if you treat other people nastily, if you treat other people with contempt, if you hate other people, it's an indicator of your relationship to God. But it goes one step further. It's not just an indicator of your relationship to God. It's an indicator of how you see yourself. So actually, I've learned that the hateful people who come to church, Pastor Bavel, I've, come, I've learned to be, um, I've learned to sympathize with them lately. So I realize it's, it's not even that you hate you. You're so mean because you don't even like yourself. You have no joy because you don't even like you. you in fact, here's what I found out about people who don't like themselves. You, know, you ever heard of things that says misery loves company? And so I think at church, there's a lot of church people who are like, listen, because I'm miserable at church and because I don't like me, I don't want to see anybody come to church and have fun and love Jesus either. And so if you come to church and you enjoy God and you stand up and wave your hand and you clap your hands and you shout in church, I get mad at you because I'm not that happy about God and I don't really love God that much. And so if you are excited about God, I need you to leave because I want to be around a bunch of people who don't love God and don't love themselves. It's quiet in here. It's quiet. I thought I'd have got at least three amens on that one. Because the reality is, is that there is self-hatred that destroys your ability to love others, but it destroys your ability to love God. Yeah. So most Christians, you have, have you met, you know, I, f I find Christians are actually schizophrenic. Did you know that? And, and I, don't, I don't really say that. I, I'm really not trying to use that loosely. I, I found that Christians are schizophrenic. You know, some of them are. Because so I've noticed this about Christians. They'll come to church, and when they come to church, they don't smile. They're serious. If you have too much fun, they label you as a wicked person. If you dress a little flashy, they look at you cross-eyed. Oh, she thinks she is. <laughs> oh, where she come from? Oh, what she a doing? Enough of that. Come out. It's because it's because 
they, they have a concept of God and a concept of themselves that's warped. My friend right here, she's, stand up, stand up, come, 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 come. This, you know, listen, ever since I come, 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 ever since I come to this church, yeah, she's been, she been looking out for me. Listen, this lady got a lot of life in her, yeah? yeah? She might not follow all the rules, but that's okay. I love her anyway. <laughs> she don't. I, I can tell she don't. That's why I like her, yeah? She, she's a little free-spirited, yeah? And, and he look at her sometimes, he's like, whoa, child, man, we don't know how she's going to make it to heaven, man. <laughs> she's too happy. She laughed too much. But this is the kind of joy that God is looking for. Because you know what? Those kind of Christians are contagious. Those are the kind of Christians that when people, they invite people to come to church, they're like, I want to know the God that you serve because your God is at least a happy God. Your God is a God of joy. Your At the root of the much of the underlying damage emotions is low self-concept or low self-esteem. You don't love you. Therefore, you can't love others. Remember what I said last night? The reason why you're having a hard time loving you and a hard time loving others is that grace has not ever hit the level of your emotions. The grace of God has never, you have an intellectual assent to God not a relational one. And so the grace of God has never washed over your spirit so that you learn that God loves you just the way you are. God not he doesn't love you when you get better. He doesn't love you when you overcome the next three sins. He doesn't love you more when you overcome some other problem in your life. He loves you as much as he's going to love you right now. In fact, the Bible says, it is the love of Christ that constrains me to do evil, not the fear of punishment. Amen. Because why? Fear has what? Torment. If I'm afraid of God, you can't really love something you're afraid of, can you? You know, we used to have a little bad dog when I was growing up as a kid, yeah? And the bad dog was so bad, we had to lock him in the backyard. My dad had the dog because he didn't want anybody because we had been broken into a couple times. And, and, so, and so he got the bad dog and he put the bad dog in the backyard because people were breaking in the glass and coming and stealing all the stuff. And so we had the bad dog in the backyard. And, 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 and listen, the dog was so bad, we couldn't even pet him. Listen, uh, we, the dog was so bad. Sometimes as a kid, the dog, he would go up under my bike. And listen, if, when he went up under the bike, if, if you wanted to get your bike, he would literally try to bite you trying to get your own bike. And, and we literally had to sneak out, jump on the bike, lift our feet up so he couldn't bite our leg off and roll down the driveway so we could get it. And, 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 and sometimes that's how we are. We, we, we're so honorary that nobody can get close to us because we don't even love ourselves. Here's some things. I want, I want, I want, I want, to, I want to give you a few things and I'm going to get out of here. There are three things that make up your self-concept and they are, here's, here, listen to these three things that make up your self-concept. Number one, you have to have a sense of belonging. This makes a healthy self-concept. If you don't have these three things, then your self-esteem is even more damaged than it already is. Number one, you've got to have a, a sense of belonging, a sense that you belong somewhere. You belong to a family. And that's why orphan kids have such a challenge because they don't have a sense that I belong. That's why people who, 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 whose family is fractured, they, they're always, when they grow up, they're always stra striving and searching to be approval. And, and that's why I have a sermon series called Overcoming the Approval Addiction. Because if you grew up in a home where you didn't have a sense of belonging, then you oftentimes grow up struggling trying to seek the approval from others because you never had a sense of belonging. And so you're looking to find approval from outside sources because you never felt the proof from the inside out. Mm. 
Three things that make up your sense of self-worth. Number, a sense of belonging. Number two, a sense of worth and value. A sense that you are worthy and you have value. And then number three, a sense of being competent. A sense that you can actually accomplish something. These three things make up your healthy self-image. And if these three things have been injured, a self sense of belonging, a sense of worth and value, a sense of being competent. That, and, and let me tell you something. Can I help you, parents? You play a big role and shaping the self-esteem of your children. I grew up in a West Indian home. I can probably count on one hand how many times that my parents actually said they loved me. They were proud of me. That gave me a hug physically. Yeah? And, and, and you know, and the reality is, is that most of you, when you, you grow up and you repeat that, you know, my parents barely like hugged each other in, in public. Yeah? Think about them. How many of you actually saw your parents like hugging each other in the kitchen and laughing and joking and, and you know, because they felt like physical affection was only for the bedroom? Yeah? My kids see me and my wife hugging and they're like, ah, oh, gross people. These are crazy. My, my, listen, parents, you're going to destroy my brain. No, I'm not going to destroy your brain. I'm going to give you a healthy self-concept of yourself to understand. I'm going to model to you what real love looks like. Right, right, right. You know, one of the most things that women really want their husband to do when they actually go out, they want them to hold their hand. Did you know that, yeah. guys? They actually want them to hold their hand. Listen, I, I'm, I'm messing some guys up. They say, well, Pastor, why you bring this here? Y'all, Yankee, if it come chat, foolishness. Yeah, I'm going to get him some game, yeah? You might get something tonight if you get there. Yeah. There's a study that's done. Is that holding, holding your, 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 your wife's hand is one of the best things are showing them public affection. So many of you don't even get public affection. He never rubs you on the back. Never puts his arm around you. Never whispers for no reason, hey, I love you. It's quiet today, Pastor. It's very, it's very, this is a rough word, huh? I'm really. Uh, Chuck, go sit on, man. <laughs> he rubbing his wife now, huh? Church time, I go. Be of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> He's a boss. I'm going to try and score three points, man. <laughs> Anytime your self-concept is distorted, then you, have, then you have a person with either a super inflated view of themselves or a person with low self-esteem. We have a president in the White House in America right now who has a super inflated view of himself, which turns him into a narcissist. This is a person who only cares about me, myself, and I. You've seen him. He, he, he has an umbrella, and, and he'll be having the umbrella, and he won't even put his wife up under it. He comes to France, and there's a there's a a, 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 a um, ceremony for World War One veterans, and because the rain and his hair is going to messed up, he doesn't want to come to the ceremony because his hair is going to get really super inflated or a super low. They're all. Terrible concepts to have. And here's what I found. Sometimes when people with super inflated uh, view of themselves, what they're actually trying to do is that they're trying to co compensate for very low self-esteem. Yeah, right. yeah. What you find out about our president is that his esteem is so low that he's overcompensating. And so he's trying to boost himself up in other ways because he feels terrible about himself in real in reality. And so he's trying to make up for what he could not have and did not receive as a child. Because his father, like many of our fathers, thought that if we just provided a great living for our children, if we just paid for their schooling, if they just got good grades, then our kids would be okay. Let me tell you something. I'd rather raise a C student with love than an A student who doesn't know how to deal with life. You know why? 
because the C student is going to be better adjusted to life than the A student who. Grades aren't everything. Yes, I need a good education. I tell that to my kids. Listen, I need, you, I need you to get a good education because I don't want you to have to sweep the streets every day, yeah? But grades aren't everything. I want a well-adjusted kid better than a Fulbright Scholar kid. Why? Because, oh, you, l- listen to me, well-adjusted, ch- I, I, you know, listen, I've had some friends, I had a friend of mine, I had a friend of mine, made straight A's through, through school, top of his class. Graduated top of his class, finally got married, had trouble in his marriage, and because he had never had to cope with failure, killed himself. Because he never knew how to deal with loss. Because all his parents ever preach, get good grades, get straight. There's another thing. Let me can I can I help? Can I help some of you? Can I help some of you with young ladies? Some of you send your kids, your young young ladies to university. Hey, go get a good education. Don't think about dating anybody. Don't date anybody. And then wonder why they can't deal with relationships. It's very quiet. You know how many women, especially, let me tell you something. You you if you have Adventist girls, you need to. T- begin to teach them how to date early. You know why? Because in Adventism, their opportunity to marry someone dwindles when they leave university. Did you know that? But you're telling them, hey, go to school. Just get your your degree. Listen, if you have a million pound in the bank, but you don't have love, your life is empty. If you have a high-powered job, but you don't have somebody to come home to, your life is empty. Best thing in my life is not the money. It's my wife and my kids. I have someone to share life with. I have someone to leave my two pennies to when I die. I got somebody to put my teeth in when I'm old. Praise the Lord. I get old, I can't find my teeth. My kids, they go, oh, dad, it's in the cup. I can't, oh, go, go. Don't give them a teeth. <laughs> but we've trained them. We've trained them in a particular area that's going to destroy them in the long run. Let me, let me get out of here. Dr. James Jobson did a survey with a large group of Christian women, asking them what they saw as the leading cause of depression in their lives. They were asked to rate in order how the ten affect these ten things affected their lives. Listen, uh, uh, these seven things affected their lives. Listen to what they are: absence of a romantic love in your marriage, in-law conflicts, low self-esteem, problems with children, financial difficulties, loneliness and isolation, boredom, health problems. He found that 50% of the women had low self-esteem as the number one cause of depression in their lives. 50% of women had as the number one cause of depression in their lives, so low self-esteem, and 75% had it in the top three things in their life. A low self-concept causes many emotional problems. That's why Jesus repeats the great commandment. He says that, listen, you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. Here's a simple reason that we hate ourselves. We have like a Numbers 13 complex of ourselves. You read the book, the the, the book in the Bible, Numbers 13. You know, number 13, the story is, is that, that they're about to go, uh, uh, go up into the promised land and, and uh, they're about to go, uh, uh, God's going to give them the, 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 the promised land that flows with milk and honey and, and he's about to give them this place and they go up there and, and you know, remember what the Bible says that they say when they get up to, to get to this land of milk and honey and they're right on the precipice of the promised land. Here's, here's a danger. Sometimes low self-esteem destroys your ability to live out God's true vision for your life. Here they're on the they're right on the edge of the promised land and and, and, and they send out twelve spies. You know the story. And 
and, and they get out there and they see the land. They realize, yes, the land flows with milk and honey. Yes, it's an incredible land. They bring back the grapes from the land. You remember the story, how the story goes. And, and then they come back and, and then they're asked to give a report of what the land is truly, if, what, if the land is truly what God promised it would be. And you remember how the report goes. Ten of the spies said, listen, yeah, truly, the land flows with milk and honey, but we are not able to possess it. Why? Because we are grasshoppers. Low self-esteem gives you a grasshopper mentality. Low self-esteem robs you from living out your God-given destiny in your life. Because the real problem is that when you think you're a grasshopper, nobody can tell you otherwise. Why? Because the Bible says it true in Proverbs. As a man or woman thinketh in his or her heart, so is he or she. If you can't think yourself otherwise, you can't live otherwise. If your grasshopper complex, because of your low self-esteem, is destroying who you are. Are. William Carey, the great missionary to India, said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. When, you're, when you expect great things from God, you attempt great things for God. But if you don't expect great things from God, hear me, then you'll never attempt great things for God. For God, the problem is once you become critical with the design, it's just a matter of time before you get mad at the designer. Mm. Let me say that one more time. It, the problem is once you become critical with the design being you. You're the design. And if you get critical with the design... It's just a matter of time before you get mad at the designer. You begin to believe that prayer really doesn't change things. Why go to church? I'm just as good as the members. And you get critical about everyone and everything. And not because you don't like the people. You have a problem with God because you don't like you. Go ahead and play. I'm getting out of here. Dr. Maxwell Maltz, the well-known plastic surgeon, after years of operating on people's face, found the sad reality that even after plastic surgery, the people's concept of themselves did not change. They were made beautiful, but they were still operating like an ugly duckling. I can tell you the single most reason why Christians don't heal after they join the church. Here's why. Because most churches don't create an environment and in, in an atmosphere for healing to take place. We are too busy trying to hold to standards and traditions that we have forgotten that we are actually dealing with damaged people. But I thank God this morning that God came to set the captives free. He came to deliver you, and he came to deliver me. God is saying today, I want to take you on a journey to heal your low self-esteem. Because why, Pastor? Because that's what's stopping you from living out your true destiny in your life. It causes you not to believe me for miracles. It causes you to not trust me for change. It causes you to, to, to be critical of yourself and therefore become critical of me. But God says, behold, brothers and sisters, now, not tomorrow, now are we the sons and daughters of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we shall be changed and be like him. Today, here's what I want to challenge somebody in this place today. There's some area of your self-esteem that is broken. I don't know what it is. There's some part of your life that is damaged and challenged. 
and you're saying, Lord, I want you to heal me from the inside out. I, want, I, I don't want any more outside in change. I want inside out transformation. I'm tired of changing the outside and the inside is still broken. I need you, Lord, to change me from the inside out so that I love me, so I can love others and I can truly love you. Help me to receive grace. So I can give grace. If that's you today and you're saying, Pastor, I want God to begin an inward healing of my life, an inward healing of my soul. I want you to stand to your feet. You're saying, God, I want you to heal my damaged emotions. Lord, I want you to heal my broken self-esteem. God, I want you to turn me around. I want you to change me from who I used to be to who you've called me to be in Jesus Christ. But here's not where my appeal ends. I believe there's somebody here today who's saying, Pastor, I don't just want to have my emotions healed. I want to be healed. I want to be set free because I believe that whom the son is set free, he or she is free indeed. There's somebody here today, I believe that God is saying, I want to set you free from sin. I want to set you free from trouble. I want to set you free from everything that has had you bound. And not only can I heal your emotions, I can heal you completely spiritually. And today, I don't know who you are, but I believe there's somebody here today whom God is saying, I want to heal you totally. And you recognize that your healing starts by saying yes to Jesus Christ. And here's my appeal for somebody else. I believe there's somebody else who's here today who's God is saying, I want you to take the first step in your transformation. And that is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and be baptized. I don't know who you are, but I believe we've been coming to church all week and we've been preaching all throughout the week because God had one purpose in mind for you. And that is to deliver you from your sins and to deliver you from yourself. I want to invite you to come down front today. I don't know who you are, but I believe you're here today. I believe that Jesus Christ wants to save you completely. He wants to deliver you from the uttermost. I want you to come out of the aisle, come down front, give me your hand and give Jesus Christ your heart. Who are you today who God is speaking to? Where God says it's time for you to be transformed. It's time for you to be baptized. It's time for you to be set free by the blood of the Lamb because there's power in the blood of Jesus. Step out of the aisle. Who are you today? God has sent me all the way from Miami, Florida to let you know that this is your time. This is your moment. This is your season that Jesus wants to change you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to heal you. He wants to renew you. He doesn't want to just change the outward. He wants to change your heart. God bless you. God bless you. Who else is here today who Jesus is speaking to? Who are you? Who are you here that Jesus Christ is saying, I want to change you. It's time for you to be baptized. It's time for you to join a church. It's time for you to be a part of the Bible-believing children of the living God. I believe there's somebody else here today. I want to invite you to step out of your chair, step out into the aisle. Give me your hand and give Jesus Christ your heart. Who else is here today whose Jesus has been speaking to for weeks, maybe months, and he's saying to you, I want to heal and fix you. Come on down. I don't know who you are, but I believe you're here in the building today. And Jesus is saying, I have been, have, been, have been laboring over you. I want to heal you. I want to deliver you. I want to change you. I want to make you brand new in Jesus Christ. I want to hold this appeal open for 30 more seconds. I don't know who you are, but I believe you're here today. And I believe Jesus has been speaking to you today. And you want to slip out of that aisle. Come on down. Don't care what anybody else is thinking. They don't have a heaven or a hell to put you in. Jesus loves you just the way you are, not when you change. He loves you just the way you are right now, today. Who are you today that God is speaking to? Come on down and 
and let Jesus have full and complete control over your life. God bless you. Even the children shall, shall lead them. Praise the Lord. Even got children coming. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, little kids. God bless you. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for those who are saying, Lord, I want my name to be written in the Lamb's book of life. Lord, I want to be set free and delivered from every stain of sin and every unrighteousness. Cleanse me, Lord, from the inside out. And Father, we thank you for those decisions today that have been made to be baptized and washed in the water and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would seal those decisions today and, and mark them in the book of remembrance on today. And Father, I want to pray for all of us who are standing and saying, Lord, heal my broken self-esteem. Teach me how to love me so I can love others and ultimately love you more. We bless you and thank you today because we ask ease and all other mercies in Jesus' mighty name. Let every child of God say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.